Welcome everyone to today's devotion. We're in First Corinthians, or I'm sorry, First John chapter two, um, and this one is much longer than uh, the first chapter. The first chapter is only about ten verses. This one is significantly longer than that, more than double than that. So I just want to highlight a few parts, and again, want to show that that the chapter continues what we saw yesterday about light and darkness. He uses some of the same metaphors in in this chapter, uh, but we really get to. Um, chapter 1 would be like a theological foundation. Uh, Christ there, the first, I believe it was four or five verses, and then the light darkness motif. Um, now he's going to get to the real meat of First John, and that is, how do we know we are in the light? Um, and and as, as we suggested yesterday, the answer is going to be truth and love, that you affirm the truth and live by love. Um, notice how... 1 John 2 uh, begins, and and I want to read this because I think it's a passage you need to memorize uh, and highlight and return to often in in, in your Bible. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now, notice what he said before that, that if we are in sin, right, we are in darkness. But he also said, if we confess our sin, right, he is right to, to forgive. He says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Now, let me just pause there real quick. I, I wish we could spend a lot more time on, on these opening verses. The word advocate there could be translated helper, counselor. Uh, the, the Greek word is parakletos, the paraclete. And, and it is the same word Jesus uses in the high priestly prayer, John 14 to 17, uh, to describe this Holy Spirit. Um, that the helper will come and be with you. John is now applying that to Christ. So it's the same author in in both. Um, And so you say that when we do sin, we have one who comes alongside. That's what paraclete means, parakletos. Uh, We have an advocate. We have a helper. We have a comforter, a counselor. uh, With the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So though we are unrighteous, Christ is righteous. And when we confess our sins, he comes alongside in his righteousness to, to help us. He, it says there, verse 2, is the propitiation uh, for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. So notice, there's that fancy word propitiation, which just means appeasement. It is, it is, an, it is an atonement that appeases the wrath of God. And John says, Christ is our advocate, our comforter, because he is the propitiation. He is the atoning appeasement uh, for the wrath of God. And he does so on behalf of our sins. So if we confess our sins, he will forgive us because of his finished work upon the cross. Then notice how quickly he does this. And by this, that is the gospel, that Christ is our propitiation for our sins. By this we know. That's the key. We know on the gospel. Notice, we know based off truth that Jesus Christ is the eternal one, the Father, who who his propitiatory sacrifice saves us from our sins. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us. That we know the truth and and so we will know by love. So we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Notice the word know is in there twice. By this we know that we've come to know him. Well, by this, the gospel, and by keeping his commandments. So out of that comes this articulation of the commandments uh, and the articulation of true knowledge. He goes back and forth to this throughout the letter and even in his second and third epistles. So notice the the emphasis on love in verses 7 to 11. Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you've heard from the beginning, which takes you back to the beginning of this, that which we heard from the beginning, right? Um, The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you. Notice he said it's an old commandment, love one another, but now it's also a new commandment because it is personified in Christ. So while he's going to get to living by love, he says you first must know the truth of what love is personified in Christ, who is your propitiation. So love is defined by the cross, not my feelings or infatuation or whatever it is uh, culture tells me. Whoever says he is in the light, verse 9, and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. Whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Again, notice the emphasis on love 
uh, that you can know if you are in the truth by your love. If you hate your brother, then, then, then you, you do not believe the truth. If you love your brother, it is rooted in a true knowledge of love, of the gospel. Right? You, you cannot separate truth and love. In fact, um, he goes on, verse 15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Again, I, I wish we had more time. I just want to emphasize here, it isn't just about loving your brother that's important. It's not loving the world at the same time. And, and there's, it's not contradictory. Because when we love the world, we surrender the truth of Christ for a false truth. But when we love our neighbor, we do so because of a true truth. I mean, and in fact, he, he summarizes the temptation of the world into three categories. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. And what's striking about that is every temptation is going to come down to at least one, if not all three of those. A good example, and let me give you two quick examples. The temptation of Adam and Eve in the garden, temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Um, the Eve saw the fruit that it was delightful for the eyes, lust of the eyes. It was good for food, lust of flesh, and that it would make her wise, pride of life. So too, Jesus is, turn these stones into bread, lust of the flesh. Uh, uh, stand on top of the temple and throw yourself off. The angels will catch you. It's the pride of life. Um, and then um, uh, bow down to me and I'll give you all of these. That's, that's, that's the um, uh, lust of the eyes, right? You see all, all the kingdoms. And this is true of, of every temptation that we will face. It will come in at least one, if not all three of these categories. But then notice, so he's emphasized love. Love your neighbor, but don't love the world. Right? Uh, because love in the world will keep you from loving your neighbor. Now he's going to talk about the truth. Verse 18, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come, therefore we know it is the last hour. Now let me just pause there and say, this does not mean what you assume it means. In fact, the word Antichrist does not appear anywhere in the book of Revelation. It only appears in 1 John. And it has nothing to do with some malevolent being uh, at the end of the world. Now, that being may exist. A lot of people equate the Antichrist of 1 John with the beast of Revelation, and that's a separate issue. But the word Antichrist just means anti-Jesus. Right? In fact, what if I told you we know who the Antichrist is? Would you like to know who it is? Notice, first of all, John doesn't speak of the Antichrist, but of Antichrists. In fact, he says, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. So John's theology is, at the ascension of Christ, we begin the end times, essentially. We are in the last days now. But um, we may know who it is John has in mind here. Go down to the end of verse 22. This is the Antichrist. Okay? All right, he's going to tell us. He who denies the Father and the Son... No one who denies the Son as the Father, whoever confesses the Son, has the Father also. Now, for the sake of time, I just want to summarize some of this. John will articulate this a little later. What he has in mind here is perhaps a person by the name of Serenthus. Serenthus is someone who denied that Christ had come in the flesh. That was a theological heresy called, um, uh, 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 he was a docetic. Uh, you deny that Jesus was fleshly, only spiritual. And um, and so it is possible he has someone in mind there named Serenthus. Now, we can't know that for sure. There are fascinating stories about with John and Serenthus. One of them is that in a bathhouse, John saw Serenthus in Ephesus, ran out screaming, saying, I don't want to be in there in case God brings the building crashing down and judgment on Serenthus, right? So it's very possible he has that man, if not that movement in mind as he writes this. But what you need to see is that rejecting the truth, the Christ has come in the flesh, Son of the Father, will lead to rejecting true love. And if you don't have truth and you don't have love, you do not have the knowledge of the Savior. And that's what matters to you. Hope to see you guys here Monday.